Okay, so let's start from where we left in the last lecture. So in the last lecture, we talked about the challenges in the lithography to pattern the small features. And here, this is the 193 nanometer lithography. And uh, this is a driving force for the past uh, few generations uh, from like, uh, 2010 to 2020. So basically, to effectively extend the capability of this 193 nanometer lithography, we have to use this double patterning, triple patterning, and quadruple patterning, basically to transfer the patterns from a larger dimension, which was fabricated by the 193 nanometer lithography directly, to small features by this spacer transfer technique. So this is what we discussed in the previous lecture. So you can deposit something around this uh, mask, and then you can uh, use that photoresist trimming technique to basically grow the spacer sidewall between the mask, and then use this sidewall as a hard mask to further edge. And you can do this two times, three times, and four times, so if you do four times, you see here, eventually you can get very small feature, and uh, you can have the very fine pitch between those features. So this is how you uh, extend the lifetime of this 193 nanometer lithography to pattern something like 15 or 20 nanometer in dimension. Of course, nowadays, the industry started uh, the transition to the EUV, the extreme ultraviolet lithography. I think this happened like two, one, one or two years ago, and then many major foundries start in, started to use the EUV for the fabrication, especially for like seven nanometer or five nanometer logic process. And also some DRAM companies also employ EUV for the DRAM and fabrication as well. So this is uh, what we left in the last lecture, and today we are going to continue our discussions uh, on the s one scaling challenges, and in particular, we are going to address some issues related to the variability. So this is a, a graph showing the s one cell size. This is a six transistor s one and also this is for the high density s one cell, that means the smallest cell size. And this is in the unit of micrometer square, and uh, for different uh, technology nodes, in the historical trend, you see this follows roughly the 0.7x. If you talk about the area, then it's about 0.5x reduction of the area per generation. And this data is from Intel, and we show some of those uh, microscopic image uh, for the s run layout after fabrication. And uh, we see this regular patterns. I hope you remember how to identify which transistor is which. And uh, you see those uh, features. And here, the 65 nanometer, because it's used only like a single patterning. So actually, you see some roughness of this gate pattern. But in 45 nanometer, the industry switched to the double patterning. So it can help to maintain the uh, rectangle shape of the skate area. And then we see like a 32 nanometer and 22 nanometer. So you see this is a very regular pattern. And you can predict shape. And also you will know the location of those transistors will always, always be like that. I will not repeat, but uh, this would be something you want to revisit after class. So this is the scanning trend, and uh, if we further extend the scanning trend to recent years, and this strictly follows the uh, scanning rule for the s run cell area in terms of micrometer square, at least uh, till like uh, 2016 or 2017. And so the enabler for the scanning will be the contact gate pitch scaling and M1 pitch scaling. So you know for the S1 cell, we discussed this before, right? So on this side, 
you have the a CGP, two CGP. And on this side, you have five M1 pitch. So you have to scale the CGP and M1 pitch to do that. So you see that in the recent years, actually the CGP deviate from the projection. So we see some sign of delay or let's say slow down of the scaling. So here are more recent data for like 10 nanometer and 7 nanometer loads. And uh, I gather this information from the major foundries. And this is uh, what you see. Historically, this scales very well, as you see here in the red, red dash line. But in starting from like 14 nanometer, 10 nanometer, and 7 nanometer in the past uh, three or four years, you see the deviation of the s cell area. This is a slow down of the scaling. And here, those are the absolute values, the bit cell area in micrometer square. So starting from 22 nanometer load, the bit cell area is already below like 0.1 micrometer square. And for today, the 5 nanometer process by TSMC, this is a, as reported 0 0.021 micrometer square. But if you normalize to the F here, of course, as we discussed before, uh, the technology load does not really correlate with any physical dimension. But if you use F as a symbol to normalize, if you assume the F is 22 or F is the 7, F is 5, if you use that to normalize the bit cell area, then you will see that in 22 nanometer load, it's still like 190 F square. This is close to what we discussed before. It's 160 F square, as we showed the example last lecture. But starting from 14 nanometer, the high density, the smallest s cell area, if you still use F equals to 14 to normalize, you see that the F square increases. And for today's 5 nanometer, if you use if you still assume F is 5 nanometer, then the cell area, basically you use this number 0 0.021 micrometer square divided by 5 nanometer divided by 5 nanometer again, F square, then you will get 840 F square. So you see that the scaling does not really follow the trajectory of the technology node. This is because Technology node, as we discussed earlier, does not really correlate with any physical dimensions. So here you see the absolute value in the micrometer square. We do see the scale, uh, slow down of the scanning, as you see here. And then we next to discuss some challenges in the s scaling. And one of that is the mismatch. So this is a butterfly curve. And uh, the match case means that the s line is perfect. And uh, you have the symmetric left branch and right branch. So as you scale down the voltage, the, the cross point or this meta stable point will strictly follow the 45 degree line here, diagonal here. But if you have mismatch, that means the left branch and the right branch do not look the same. For example, the threshold voltage may be different. Then if you scale down, then you see this is uh, somehow twisted. And then the noise margin, as we defined before, will be the smaller square, right? smaller one. So this will impose further challenges for the s run scaling if you have the mismatch. So here, if we run the if we measure multiple cells in the s run array, or even if you just run the Monte Carlo simulation uh, in your size hidden spectra, for example, if you run the Monte Carlo simulation, then you will generate a group of curves for the butterfly. This indicates the spread out the process variation. And uh, you see that as, the, as we Further scale from 45 to 32 to 22 nanometer, 
the spread out uh, ex further expand and then the noise margin will further shrink so this is due to the variability and the variability actually may increase with the scaling so this impose challenges in the s run design of course this is still a challenge for the logic process but s run will also suffer and here we choose the same technology node but we just uh, simply reduce the vdd from 1.1 volt to 0.7 volts and you see that of course the vdd is scaled down then the margin of becomes smaller and smaller and here you don't even can distinguish the noise margin so for more advanced node we want to reduce the power supply voltage but this will impose some challenges in the s run noise margin so for any questions So we are going to discuss what causes this problem in the next, and then uh, I would say you have to rely on, of course, you want to optimize the process, um, but you have more rely on the circuit technique to improve those uh, red margin, read margin, as we discussed before, those like uh, techniques, and also you, you have to read the homework, so you have to use some uh, pulsing skin to improve the margin or you have to modify the bit cell structure so there's no way to get rid of the variation as you see in the next we discuss some of the key uh, source for the variation so here we let's review the courses for the uh, so-called intrinsic parameter fluctuation in the MOSFET structure so here, this is a, an ideal arc MOSFET. And you have the smooth boundary and the uniform offset thickness and the continuous doping distribution in the substrate and source and the drain. So this is the ideal view of the MOSFET. But this view may not be valid when we scale down the dimensions of the transistor to today's like, tens of nanometer, because there are many non-ideal effects that cause variations from one transistor to another. So here, for example, we identify some of those challenges here. The first one is so-called line edge roughness. So the boundary of, this, of those patterns will be rough, will not be straight line. And we will discuss more details in the next few slides. But then the different transistors may have different roughness. So therefore, the like the L, because you define the L in this way. Then here different transistors may have different L. And also here nowadays we switch to the metal high K metal gate technology. That means the gate material is a metal. So the typical metals, they use like alloys. So you have different, uh, like uh, for example, tungsten, maybe aluminum or something. So different kinds of alloys to tune the work function. So here then the alloy of the metal may have so-called the uh, metal work function variation because those alloys will have different kind of uh, grains. Then you will have different metal work function for different devices. So this is not continuous. You have some like regions with more content of certain, for example, certain metal. Then you will have this metal work function variation. This metal work function directly translates to the threshold voltage. And also the, like the random dopant fluctuation that means here in the substrate, for example, if it's MOS, then you have P-type substrate, you have P-type doping in the substrate. But the, because of the doping density, if you really calculate that, those number of dopants 
in the channel region, maybe only like 10, 20, 50, you can count the number of dopants. So you cannot assume this doping is uh, uniform across the channel. So you have discrete uh, dopants, and then this will cause this random dopant fluctuation, RDF. So all of those effects will contribute to the variation of the transistor. So let's look at some of those challenges we already mentioned. The random open fluctuation, RDF, and the non-edge roughness, mostly for the gate, for the buff transistor, but for the thin fat, we will have thin non-edge roughness. And the metal work function variation, this is called high-k metal gate technology. So I would say those three uh, sources are static effects. That means once you fabricate the device, then you will have those effects uh, uh, static. That means it will be there forever. And uh, it also means this is a spatial variation. That means from device to device, you have different kind of performance due to those three behavior. And then we will further introduce two more temporal effects. This is not, this is non-static. That means even for the same transistor, as time goes by, then you will have different parameters. This may be caused by this random telegraph noise, RTN, or it may be caused by the negative bias temperature instability, MBTI. This is for PMOS, for MOS is the TBTI. And we will discuss more in the next few slides. So here, why would the S run suffer most from the variation? So here, this is just some simulation uh, from this paper. So this just uh, assumes the channel length is like 30 nanometer, 18 nanometer, 25 nanometer. And then we run like, the Monte Carlo simulation for the s run cell to get the static noise margin. And if you plot that, you get distribution. And you say that as the channel scales down, then the uh, SNM tends to have a wide di distribution. And sometimes you don't even get the noise margin. So why are the s run cells sensitive to the variation? This is because in most of the cases, s run cell we want high density. So we use the smallest feature size, smallest W over L, uh, to minimize the area. Therefore, this is more sensitive to the variation. And also, the s run we just create some delta V in the read process. So it's not full logic, like a VDD to ground operation in the s run cell. So you only rely on a small delta V, maybe 100 millivolts, 200 millivolts, to detect the signal. Therefore, this is a, a kind of a mixed signal operation. You may suffer more from the variation. OK, so let's look at those individual sources one by one. Uh, the first one is this random token fluctuation. And this, have, uh, this actually uh, occur in most of the bulk transistor uh, below like 50 nanometer. You will definitely, be below 65 nanometer technology load, we will definitely see this. Uh, so basically, here this is a simulation of the distribution of the dopant, and you know the source and the drain are like a, but this is an, a MOS, so source and drain are n-type doping, and then the channel is p-type doping, and channel doping density is lower. Your source and drain want to make good contact, therefore you have very high, den high doping density, typically more than 10 to power 20 per centimeter cube. But for the channel, it's like uh, 10 to power 18, uh, and ten, uh, per centimeter cube. So here, the dopant actually randomly distributed in the channel. And you see here many of them. But this is a, a large non-channel device. If you scale the transistor dimension, because of the, the area, or let's say the volume under the channel reduces. So here, we show the number of dopants here on this graph. We show the number of dopants with the channel length. So here, if the channel is 120 nanometer, you still have like several hundred of dopants. So here, as you see, see this graph, you have many of them. 
But as you shrink the channel length, let's say to like 20 nanometer for today's transistor, you only have like 50, less than 100, 50 dopants. So you can count individual dopants in the channel region. So we will discuss what may be the trouble here. Uh, but empirically, you can get the random dopant fluctuation contribution to the sigma of the threshold voltage followed by this kind of equation. So this is a first order model, a sigma of the VTH uh, equals to Q over cell X. And you know Q is charge, cell X is the gate capacitance per unit area. And square root NA, NA is the doping concentration. WDM is the depletion width. That means how effective the channel is. And then, I mean, how, how, how deep the channel is. And then three times L times W, L and W, this is, you know, the area of the gate, L, and then, you know, the W. So here, what matters most is L times W, so the gate area. If you shrink the gate area, then you will suffer more from this threshold variation caused by RDF. And we need to understand more what might be the real reason for the random dopant fluctuation. So first of all, you need to understand what is the role of dopant. Let me ask the question. So what, what do we need to do the doping in the transistor? What is the essential job for the dopant in the channel? Any idea? It again for the for the conductivity. No, actually, no. So actually, you add the dopant. The, let's say for MOS, you add p-type dopant there is to suppress the current. Or in other words, if you recall the, I hope that um, you still remember the PN junction the band diagram. So for the MOSFET along the channel direction, you have this kind of band diagram. If you recall. Right. So this is the ECEV. If you recall the pin junction, because this is force is n type uh, and channel is p type and drain is n type, right? So pin junction band diagram you have this built-in barrier, and then NPN you have this uh, shape of the barrier, and then you have electrons, many of the electrons in the source, right? Of course, you have many of them in the dream as well. So here, the dopant job is to create this barrier. If you have more p-type, higher p-type concentration, you have higher barrier here, right? So this is to separate the source and the dream electrons. And then the transistor, as we discussed before, what it, it does is to lower down the barrier if you have the gate voltage applied, right? You are going to push down the barrier in the channel region, then you, you will have current flow. Of course, you apply VD to further pull down this side. As we discussed before, the electrons are like water, right? You, you, this is like a dam. So you lower down the barrier, then the electron will flow over. So here, the, you see the job of the dopant is to create this barrier. So here the assumption is that you, if you have the dopant uniformly in the channel, then you can hold the water, let's hold the electron in the source uniformly, then you will not have the leakage. Because the threshold voltage, as we defined, you know, is the critical voltage that the gate needs to apply to create significant amount of the current. So here we show two examples here. You see those two uh, transistor. This I believe this is the equal potential, like iso potential contour of the transistor in the 3D view. So here the you see those points. 
uh, where you have the tokens. So if, if you think about, if you have one token here, so locally you're going to raise the potential. You're going to raise the potential, you're going to create this barrier, right? If you have tokens uniformly across the channel, then you can hold all the electrons in the source. Therefore, you can have very low leakage of current. You will have a good, I mean, reasonable VTH threshold voltage. But if somehow you are unlucky, right? Then if all your like uh, tokens somehow, because you don't have many of them, as we discussed before, you only have like 20, 30 tokens in today's channel. Not today, I mean, in 20 nanometer load uh, channel. Then if you somehow your token all concentrate here without anything here, then this, there's no barrier. If there's no barrier, you know, the current will easily flow. That means this, for the device on the right hand side, you have much lower threshold voltage because the current is easy to flow. So here this illustrates the importance of the location of the dopant. And because of the randomness in the dopant injection during the fabrication, you cannot control exact location of the dopant. So even you have the same like uh, density, uh, you define in the uh, variation uh, in the fabrication, but in reality, each device may have different location of the dopant. That will result in the variation of the threshold voltage. So here there's another example here. If you measure the transistor on the wafer, then you get many of the uh, you get a, like a, a VTH and unstate current for particular device. And then here you can ma measure many of them. You can get the distribution. So here we show the sample A and sample B. So they have similar unstate current but they have quite different VTH. The reason, if you look, I believe this is generated from the simulation. If you look at the, the, uh, uh, like the, ten, the, the dopant distribution in sample A, there's no dopant in this region. Therefore, there's a leakage pass. Leakage pass, it has lower VTH for sample A. And this random open fluctuation matters more for the threshold voltage and off current. It does not really matter for the on state. Because for the on state, you will apply gate voltage to lower down all the barrier. So you, no matter you have barrier built in by the dopant or not, for the on state, you apply gate voltage, you have to lower down all the barriers anyway. So mostly this will affect on the threshold and the off current. And the next uh, variation source is called Lang Edge Roughness, LER. And this is uh, also unavoidable, I would say. This is due to the fabrication by the lithography and the following edge. So here, this graph shows some of the characterization results for the surface roughness of, uh, across the stack. And I would say here, this is a uh, Let's say this is bottom of the wafer. You have a silicon substrate. And then this is the top of the wafer during the fabrication. For example, you, you, you apply light this way. It's 193 nanometer wavelength, the, the light. And then you have the photoresist on the surface that will behave like a mask, right? So the photoresist. Uh, after you shine the light, of course, depending on this photoresist is exposed, exposed to the light or not. Then, if it's, for example, if it's a positive photoresist, if you're exposed to the light, then after the develop process, so basically you put the photoresist in some kind of chemical solution, and the photoresist will resolve, I mean, dissolve. So after it dissolves, then the edge of the photoresist will have this kind of roughness. This is because the photoresist is made of polymer, 
the organic, you know, the stuff. So the polymer has the is made of molecular basically. So the molecular will have some like you get let's say you peel off one more molecular here, or you have still remain one molecular here. So you have some roughness at the edge. It's a it's a polymer, and the roughness typically is like uh, let's say a, a few nanometer. So here that means when you pattern the if you think about the pattern, you want to make a square here. Right, this is your photo resist, and then you want to use that to etch your your underlying structure. So this photo resist, that means this edge is rough. So if you use this rough edge as hot mask to etch the materials underlying this photo resist, this roughness, the pattern will be transferred to the underlying structure. If you pattern a let's say a metal wire, right? If under the photo resist is metal, you want to pattern a metal wire, then this roughness of the photo resist will be transferred to the roughness of the wire after your edge. So here this is the, the problem of the non-edge roughness. And here there are some categorizations of those wires, as you said, after the patterning, then the wire, the edge, will look a bit smooth. You have some like roughness, and if you measure the roughness, like three sigma of the, uh, the rough, roughness, you will see about, so this is a independent of how wide the wire is. If you have a wide wire, you have this roughness. That is here, for example, if you have a Long width, like 200 nanometer, you still have like a, a few nanometer roughness. Or if here you pattern a small, let's say, a, a, a lateral wire, a 50 nanometer, you still have a few nanometer roughness on the edge. So this roughness, LER, independent of how wide your wire is, then this may, may become a problem for the scale of the devices, because for the scale devices, you know, the wire, the wire length on the wire width is small. So for example, if you, this wire width is like 20 nanometer, and if you have, if you have two nanometer variation, that's already 10%. This may not be an issue before, right? You have 400 nanometer, 200 nanometer wire, you have like a two nanometer variation, it's only 1%, doesn't matter. But nowadays, if you have 20 nanometer wire width, you have 10% of variation that will cause or not. So here, if you think about the this wire is like a gate length. So this gate length may have, this is a salt and drain. So you may have roughness. And that means the L may be different for different transistor. This will cause a lot of variations in both the off-state current and on-state current. So any questions so far? Okay, so let's talk about some of the temporal variations. So this may happen on the same transistor. So this VTH fluctuation due to the RTN, random telegraph noise. So here, this is a a measurement of the VTH if you bias the transistor with a constant drain voltage and then you can measure the VTH. Or in other words, if you have a bias, constant bias to the drain voltage, you can measure the fluctuation in the drain current. So but here the point is that the transistor's drain current or threshold voltage is not static as time changes, then you may have different numbers. So why is that? This may because of the RTN, that is when the let's say the source and drain. You have electrons or a MOS coming from the source to the drain. But as the electrons travel in the channel, if the oxide here has some trap, 
or defect, which may capture the electron in the channel. So let's draw it again. So let's say new electrons travel in the channel, but somehow if here there is a trap in the gate oxide, then these electrons may be captured into the trap. So in other words, your, your current will reduce because you have less number of electrons uh, follow, follow to the drain. So temporarily, your current will reduce, but after some time, the electrons may jump out from the trap. Then your current will go back to the original value. So this causes a temporal fluctuation of your drain current. And you can translate that to the fluctuation of the threshold voltage. If you have a current source to the drain, then that will be reflected as a gate voltage variation. Then that will cause the delta VTH. And uh, if here we show that this uh, run telegraph noise means that you can see two distinct levels of the threshold voltage and over time. So here the time scale is typically like milliseconds, milliseconds to seconds. And the two level RTN is caused by a single trap in the channel. So if during the channel, if you have a single trap, then you will capture one electron and uh, emit one electron. So then you will have the uh, two level response. But if in the channel you have many traps, so those traps you know may get different, um, may, may uh, have different uh, like dynamics, different response time. Then if you have many traps, so basically you will average out the this like uh, two level fluctuation, you will have like a really random value if you have more traps. But then because some of the traps capture, some of the traps emit, so then you can average out or smooth out some of those uh, extreme values. But overall you will still see like noise in the green current. Or if you translate that to the threshold voltage, then you will see that over time. And here for the RTN because it matters more because it will give you extreme like, cases. And here you can measure the delta VTH due to the RTN and for different technology uh, uh, nodes, different dimensions. And for you see here with the channel length like uh, 25 or 30 nanometer, you will see a big tail in the threshold voltage. It may change up to like 50 millivolts, 60 millivolts over time. So this may be a trouble, right, for the s run design. Why is that? Because you have to budget for this variation. When you when you design it, your for example, your noise margin, right? You have to consider the the the, the uh, extreme cases in the VTH. So this and then there's another long-term effect for the BTI bias temperature instability. And uh, here this is for PMOS. So PMOS suffers more. And the PMOS, because we are per negative gate voltage, so this is called a negative B, uh, BTI, MBTI. So basically it says that if you apply gate voltage to the transistor for a long time, especially for the PMOS transistor, and especially when you have higher temperature of your chip, if you keep running, for example, if your laptop keep running, and keep running this like video call, or whatever, then it becomes hot, and then you keep running, that means you keep applying the voltage on the gate. Then the threshold voltage may drift over time. This is an, uh, this may, may be a long-term effect. It can last for like seconds, minutes, or even hours. So here, typically if you want to measure this, you can accelerate accelerate the testing. So you can 
apply a very high voltage. Nominally, for example, your VDD is like one volt. But if you want to accelerate for the testing purpose, you can apply like a two volts. And then you can increase the temperature. So if you do that and measure the VTH over time, you will see that it will keep drifting. And the empirically, you can fit the drift with this drift of the VTH with this polynomial function. A is the coefficient, N is the net coefficient as function of time. So here, that means if you keep using your transistor, it will degrade over time. The threshold voltage will increase, basically. For PMOS, that means the absolute value will increase. For PMOS, it will become even negative for the threshold voltage. So here, uh, uh, if you this is like a static noise margin for the S run, and you can measure it after some stress voltage. Initially, you may have a larger, let's say this blue one, you have a largest noise margin. But as time goes by, if you keep using that as using a stress voltage to accelerate that, after 10,000 uh, 10, seconds, then you will decrease your noise margin. So this is a, a, a problem for the long-term reliability because in the, those testing, you accelerate, you intentionally accelerate this uh, process. But if you, you are in the normal like uh, operation environment, then this effect may show up after like months or years. So this is aging effect. If you keep using your chip, then it will become slower, for example. And you may notice that, right? If you, you keep using your laptop for, for a few years, then you will see that it will respond slower because the threshold voltage of those transistors increases over time. So that means, given the spec of your product, you have to account for the worst case, right? If you expect the lifetime is 10 years, then you have to use this kind of ETI projection, and then you have to design the margin towards the end of the lifetime of your design, right? So you have to uh, 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 account for that. So there's a design for manufacturing that is to consider the process variation, and there is a design for reliability. So you have to consider your design that can last for a long time. So here to summarize the VTH variation, okay, you have so many non-ideal effects, and they are kind of independent, statistically independent. That means uh, you can add the contribution from each force, like a random token and the LNR work function. You can add them like uh, using the square format, where the, the basically the square of the total threshold variation is the individual contribution of those individual items squared. And here we show this so-called pair grown plot. This is a threshold voltage variation sigma as a function of the heat area, one over, one over the square root. This is because from this random token fluctuation, you have this one basically one over, this is proportional to the one over square root of the L and W. So here, if it's only a uh, random dopant fluctuation, you will have this straight line. But as you scale down the transistor, so this is one over area. So this becomes larger, that means a smaller area. You will see that other effects will kick in. That means here the variation will further increase due to other uh, process variation. And typically transistor, if you look at the PTK, you will see the sigma is like 30 millivolts, 40 millivolts, even 50 millivolts. So this is very typical for today's transistor.
All right, next we will briefly discuss the soft error. So soft error is an effect of the radiation. So here, there are two kind of mechanisms to cause the soft error. The first one is due to the so-called alpha particle. Alpha particle is essentially the helium 2 plus. This comes from the nuclear decay of the unstable isotopes from the packages, for example. And this can be shielded, so this may not be a big concern. What really matters here is the cosmic ray. This is come, coming from the universe, the space. So you, it make, cosmic ray may include the high energy neutrons or the heavy ions. So basically, Actually, we are receiving those cosmic ray always, for example, even right now, right, we are receiving that. Uh, of course, this will be more if you are on the uh, air plane or if you are in the outer space. But anyway, for the electronic product, you, you will receive that. And then the challenge here is that once you receive the particles from the cosmic ray, if this particle hit the silicon, especially in the pin junction, for example, the you know here the source and the body, you have the pin junction. If the particle hit the pin junction, so the, this particle will transfer its energy to the silicon substrate. So basically, it will excite the electron and hole pairs from the silicon. So basically, silicon. If you think about silicon, right? So you have the EC and the EV conduction band and wind band. If your particle come in has higher energy than the band gap, then basically the energy transfer from your particle to the silicon. Then the silicon will generate a hole and uh, an electron, right. electron hole pair. So the electron and hole pair if they are generated in the pin junction region, then they will be separated. Why is that? This is because in the pin junction, for example, this is the source and this is your channel. Or let's say source and the substrate. Body. This pin junction. The source and body. So here, if you create the electron, and hole. So as we discussed, electrons are like water, so it will go to lower potential, it, it will go to the source, and the hole is like a bubble, it will pop up, so it will go to higher potential. So basically, electron and hole are split in the pin junction region, if you have the electron hole pair. So this will cause trouble, because this essentially you know, when the electron and the hole move, that means the charge are moving, that means current. So this is called the photo current. Uh, for example, this is like a photo current. You have your light, like a even high energy, like a gamma ray, and you know, all kinds of those uh, waves are essentially like a light, right? So it's photo current. So then you will create this kind of photo current in the silicon. This will cause trouble. It will cause some transient current injection into the silicon. And uh, you are familiar with this, right? Then it's like a noise current inject to your SRAN node. Then this will cause the state flip of the SRAN. But this is not a permanent failure. You will just flip the state. You can reprogram or you re rewrite your pattern. So this is called soft error because it's not permanent. Now, as we discussed before, right, the noise injection, you have here the certain requirements, right? Because the SRAM, as we discussed before, will automatically recover. It has certain uh, tolerance to the noise. So here, you, you, you can model this as we discussed, 
you have photo current injection to the storage node, right? And so if you have the current flow this way, we then depending on how large the current is or how many, depending on the strength of the strike, like how many particles hit that, and also different particle may have different energy. So then you will have to account for that. So basically depending on the total like uh, strength, the strike, like the duration, and also the number of charges, electron hole pairs it creates, then it may determine whether the split may happen or not. And we have seen this trajectory before, right? If you have a small strike, then after some time, if the, because this is a transient effect, then it will go back to the original state. But if this strike is long enough, then you may flip the state. And this is a transient waveform for the two load, this two storage node voltage. This is before it crosses the boundary of the flip, then it can recover. But if the strike is strong enough, then it may cause the flipping. So basically this is similar as what we discussed before for the Lois injection. This is one way to inject the Lois to the s cell caused by the cosmic ray. And here, why do we care about the uh, soft L rate in the s run? People don't really talk about that for the d run. There is a reason. Actually, all the, all the electronic products you know, will receive the cosmic ray. But s run in, in particular is a concern. There's a concern. This is because for the d run, Still, DRAM storage charge, we'll discuss DRAM later, but you know DRAM is a capacitor to hold the charges. This capacitor is a preset capacitor. It's not a preset capacitor. It's, this capacitor is what you in, intentionally fabricate. But this capacitance does not really scale over the technology load. So even you have smaller technology load, this capacitance is large. That means if you want to introduce more charges or extract charges from the capacitor, it will not, uh, it, or in other words, let me put it this way. There are two factors to affect the soft error. One is the, the critical charge that you have on this storage node, the critical charge. For example, if the storage node is zero, then you have a critical charge that the Lois needs to inject into the load to flip the state. Then has, it, it is determined by this critical charge. The other consideration is the area, the so-called sensitive area. Sensitive area to collect the cosmic ray. So this is a collective area. For well, DRAM is not an issue. The reason is that as we scale down the DRAM technology, then this DRAM you know, dimension becomes smaller. Then each bit will have smaller collective area. So it less chance. It has less chance to receive the cosmic ray. And then you have like a crit the DRAM critical charge also stays the same because the DRAM capacitor Stay the same. We will discuss that in the DRAM section. So DRAM, that means with scanning, you have smaller area to receive the cosmic ray, but DRAM is as strong as older technology node. I think this way. So then the DRAM is not a big problem at the bit level. Of course, at the system level, you have you, if you have more cells, then even though each cell has less probability to flip, but you have more cells on the wafer, then you still, at the system level, you will have certain like, error rate. But for the s runs a more problem. This is because for the s run as you scale down the dimensions, of course, the area of, for example, the transistor scale, that means this collective area shrink. 
At the same time, the storage node, because it's relying on the parasitic capacitance, also shrink. The critical, the crit, two critical, also shrink. So then at the bit level, each cell, the error probability is roughly the same. But as you pack more s cells on the chip, then the array level or the system level error probability will increase. So that means SRAM will suffer more from the soft error. That's why people talk about soft error in the SRAM design, but not in the DRAM design. This is because SRAM, the critical charge, or this is the parasitic cap, reduce as you scale. But for the DRAM, the critical charge stay roughly the same. Okay, so then one more issue for the SRAM. This is a multi-bit error. So this is a really a more serious issue for the SRAM. That means what? So here, if the if you consider two SRAM cell, so if the first cell, this node stores one, if this node receives the cosmic ray, it may not only reflip the cell zero, the first cell here, it may also flip the adjacent cell. So this means multi-bit error. You have one strike here, but it may flip multiple cells around that strike. So why is that? We need to understand. So this is a called, this is a through this called match up effect. So let's look at those two cells. So firstly, this uh, N2 node of the cell zero stores one. So means this is VDD here. And uh, let's assume that you have a cosmic ray hit this junction. So as we discussed, we create electron hole pairs, and then electrons goes to higher potential because this is VDD, right? This is one VDD. So electrons will be collected to this node. And then the hole are generated in the substrate. And hole is to go to lower potential. So lower potential on the chip, you know, will be ground. But this hole is to find the ground to sink those hole current. So where is the ground? If you think about this SRAM array, you will have the body contact to the substrate. So this is like the body contact. But the body contact is shared among all the cells in the array. You will not have individual body contact to each SRAM cell. So that means at the edge of the array, you will have the body contact. So then the host needs to travel under the substrate, I mean under the substrate all the way to the body contact. So as the host travel along, this substrate is a p-type, so and p-type substrate. It has some finite resistance for the silicon, p-type silicon. So as the electrons or the current flow along the substrate, this will have some R well. This is the p-type silicon resistance. So basically you create some IR drop across the substrate. So here then this is a VDD, uh, sorry, this is ground for sure, ground. But as the current flows through this substrate, you are going to create some IR drop. That means the substrate uh, potential is raised up from the ground. So here, for example, at this node, Vp, this is larger than zero. So that means here in this substrate, at this point, close to the strike in this region, the substrate bias is positive. So if this Vp is positive, then it may cause trouble. That means somewhere here, this voltage is Vp, this is larger than zero in the substrate. So you look at this the adjacent cell, this one, and one node. If it stores one here, 
So this N1 node in this graph is here. This is its N1 node, and it stores one VDD. And then here, this is uh, the PMOS, re uh, PMOS region. This is uh, this PMOS. Oh, sorry, not PMOS. I mean, here, this is uh, another N well. Oh, sorry, the source and drain N type doping. So basically, between those adjacent transistors from the layout point of view, you will have the PMP DJT bipolar junction transistor turned on here. Why is that? If you look at uh, this region, you will have the N, N, and the, since the substrate VP is larger than zero, so this is P. So you have NPN, that's a BJT turned on. This is VDD. You store one. This is zero. So this is like a, a BJT. So you have this prosthetic current flowing. So this current will discharge this one node. That means this will sleep. So here is the prosthetic NPN by polar junction BJT leads to the so-called <coughs> natch up, up effect. So here that means this VP, as long as the VP is high enough, the adjacent cell, where the one node uh, will suffer from this natch up effect. So of course, as the VP, I mean, as the current in the substrate travel with the body contact, then this VP, this potential will decay over the distance. So that means further out, then the VP will reduce. Therefore, this BJT, you know, still you need to have some BJT VP larger than some voltage to turn on this BJT. But as you move further out, then the VP reduce, then you will not have this effect. So that means this effect will close to where the strike happened, but the neighboring region will suffer from this. So one strike may cause multiple bit flip. And this is a major issue for scaled SRAM technology today. If you want to use it in the radiation environment, or even on the next airplane, this is a big issue. Uh, of course, then there are some strategies to uh, deal with this. One of that is to use the so-called SOI technology, and this is standard technology for the radiation hard SRAN design. And of course, there are some other techniques, like you add more transistors into the SRAN cell to make it more robust. But if you don't want to change the uh, 60 transistor design, then you have to use uh, SOI technology. This is silicon on insulator. That means the substrate here is no longer the silicon. You have the insulator. You only have very bottom, you have the silicon. Sorry, at the very top, you have a silicon, only a few nanometers thick. And then here, all the way down to the substrate is insulator. If you have an insulator here, then you don't have this uh, substrate current flow, then you will not have this problem. But SOI is more expensive to fabricate in terms of the fabrication cost. And then this multi-bit error may increase over the scaling. This is because as you scale down, then this VP, this distance, may travel more cells. I mean, in, I mean, in absolute values, it may travel the same distance. But as you scale down the technology node, then each SRAN cell becomes smaller, then this decay of the VP voltage may, you know, span over more cells. So it may cause more bits to flip. So in the SRAN design, you will still need some kind of ECC error correction to deal with this kind of error. 
So any questions here? Then if not, then we will move to the last part of the S run. So this is about the fin fat. So first we will discuss some of the device structure innovation. So here this is a conventional planar buck transistor. And then you have the W and you have the L and then you have a spacer and you have the gate, plus and drain. And the current is flowing on the surface of the silicon channel underneath the gate. And then in the fin fat, we create this uh, non planar 3D structure. This is a fin. So then the gate is covering the fin by three sides. So the surface of the channel will be this two side wall plus the top surface. So here then still this is L, but the W you have to be careful. So where is the W in the fin fat? So here we say that the W effective is twice of the fin height plus thickness of the fin. Right? Because as we show here, you have two sides conducting and also the top gate, underneath the top gate, you are conducting. So then you have three sides. But in the conventional planner, you only have this side conducting. Only one surface. So this is a fin fat, and uh, as we discussed, fin fat is better for the short channel effect. This is because enhanced gate control. So you can think, right? So uh, if you previously uh, the planner, for example, if you think planner, right, this is your planner, and then you have the gate on top. So gate only controls the surface. But if you make it this way, okay, and then you have the gate around from the fin, like the two sides, then the gate will have better coupling to the channel. So you can control the channel better. As we discussed before, the transistor MOSFET essentially is a gate controlled device. So you want the gate to have a full control of the channel on and off. You don't want the drain to turn on the channel. So this is the basic idea behind the fin fat from the electrostatic point of view. Yes, questions? Okay, for this example, of course, then we have uh, two fins, then you will have, yeah, you have to, let's say, times the number of fins, all right. You mean this side? Because gate only, gate will end here, right? Under this, that is the substrate. So you, of course, you see here, your gate only covers this side, right? So this side, you don't have a gate, right? This is to your silicon substrate. So your gate only covers three sides. So this bottom part is the same. This is called the bulk fin fat. This is bulk transistor. And this, this is silicon bulk as well. So this is connected to, to your substrate. There's no, no gate control there. And this is the insulator. This is like your, your isolation. This blue region is isolation. Like STI, shallow trench junction. Shallow trench isolation. Okay, so here then, let's move on about the history of the fin fat. So here the credit 
will be given to UC Berkeley, a Professor Chemin Ho's group, as you many of them, many of you know. He is the, like, the father of the FinFET. And uh, uh, in, back in 1998, uh, his group presented the first FinFET design in one of the most important conference in the device area called IEDM, International Electron Device Meeting. And this is the original design from the paper. And uh, at that time, they can make a work. This is already more than you know 20 years ago. So this is uh, uh, the dimension of the fin, like uh, width is 20, height is 50, and then gate length is uh, 30 nanometer. This is uh, the original design. And then this is IDVG, of course, in log scale. And then this is IDVD. And you see pretty uh, good. Uh, and this star characteristics. And then one year, so by the way, this is a MOS. And then one year later, the same group presented the first PMOS in fact. And then, you know, PMOS, everything is negative. So that's why you show the negative gate voltage. This is IDVG and this is IDVD. And then after how many years? Like uh, 1998 to 2012, that's 14 years research and development from academia, universities, then later to the industry. So Intel was the first company to commercialize the FinFET in 2012. This is uh, they call it Trigate initially to avoid some patent issue with UC Berkeley probably. So. The data is still called the FinFET now. So this is uh, introduced at 22 nanometer technology load. And here we show some of the microscopic image of the FinFET. So here I want you to understand how this looks like. So here this is a bird eye view. And uh, here this would be the fin. And this is like your gate. And you have multiple things here. And then you have a source and a drain, for example, here. And then you have a gate surrounding this fin. So here we further cut the knife of this structure. You, you cut. And then you take the cross sectional view for those images. For example, here from the, let's say, the AA dimension. That is uh, this this direction. If you cut a slice along the AA dimension, you will you will get the figure here. This is uh, along the AA slice. So here you see the cross-sectional view of the fin, and then in this case you can measure it like uh, the the width fin width is about eight nanometer, and fin height is about 34 nanometer, and this is the silicon here. And then, of course, you have the gate oxide and the metal, um, let's say, gate oxide, and then metal gate. I would say this all metal, metal sorry, this is like all kinds of dielectric for the gate oxide, and then you have the metal outside. So this is uh, the MOS structure. And then if you cut along the BB direction, let's say if this is the BB direction, if you cut along the BB direction, you will see the, this is the source and drain contact, source and drain contact, and then this is a gate, a gate is in and out of the plane. And then you see the fin is somewhere here. So then you will see the contact gate pitch. In this case, 90 nanometer. And roughly it's four times of the F, if you think F is 22 nanometer. So this is a, a, a tri gate design. And then you can get the effective 
W, right? In this case, two times thirty-four nanometer plus eight nanometer. So this gives you like uh, seventy-six nanometer. So that means one fin here, the W is seventy-six nanometer, and the L here is uh, around like uh, thirty nanometer. Or 28 maybe around that this is l but the w effective is next 76 so any questions here hmm? Green? this is test structure this is not real a uh, 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 fabrication, but the dream can be common, right? Dream, you can connect to the, for example, if this is the inverter, right? Then you have the MOS and PMOS region, right? Then this is, for example, this is uh, your ground. This is your VDD, right? This is your way out. This is your way in. If you connect them together, you know, it's like an inverter. But of course, this is a test structure. But in in the real design, you, you, you can have that, right? So so we'll show some of the layout later. But uh, yeah, the source engine can be collected. Basically, a uh, one fin fat, you can have multiple fins, and those multiple fins will share the same, will share the same gate, will share the same source, will share the same drain. All right, so I think time is up. Any questions from online? No, if no, then we will stop here today.